Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. Each week since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic in March of 2020, our congregation has gathered together at least twice. On Thursday night, when we tend to our community and each other directly on Zoom, and on this service, on Sunday morning broadcast on YouTube. Sunday morning, whether in person or on YouTube, is a chance to proclaim who we are and what we are about, throwing open the doors of the congregation and proclaiming the radical love and welcome that is at the heart of our shared faith. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln, we say, aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and the world. And right now, this fall, in this year when so much is uncertain, we know the transformation is necessary. This is the place. This is the time. Who will we be? How will we be? In a time of anxiety and pandemic and fear, what are we called to be as a community? This is, as Reverend Susan Frederick Gray puts it, no time for a casual faith. And this right here, right now, is where we practice. And as Susan Frederick Gray puts it, this is no time to go it alone. And so this right here, right now, is where we practice together. So take a moment as we begin. Be present right here, right now. Let go of what you've carried here. Set aside what will come later. Just be right here together. There is work to be done. Let's be about it. Our chalice lighting words this morning are from Jan Richardson. With every step you take, she writes, this blessing rises up to meet you. It has been waiting long ages for you. Look close and you can see the layers of it. How it has been fashioned by those who walked this road before you. How it has been created of nothing but their determination and their dreaming. How it has taken its form from an ancient hope that drew them forward and made a way for them when no way could be seen. Look closer, and you will see this blessing is not finished, that you are a part of the path it is preparing, that you are how this blessing means to be a voice within the wilderness and a welcome for the way. Welcome to worship on this Sunday morning. I'm the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. It is my pleasure this morning uh, to, uh, to be participating in a pulpit swap uh, with the Reverend Sherry Woodbury of uh, First Unitarian in Omaha. So as this plays on YouTube, I am currently uh, joining the congregation in Omaha, uh, preaching there, um, while Reverend Woodbury preaches here in Lincoln. Uh, it's a pleasure to have her. It's a pleasure to, to um, be in relationship with our two congregations uh, and to be able to do these things, uh, these pulpit swaps, on a regular basis. Hello, our story today is called Nothing to Do by Douglas Wood. The author starts the story by saying, there's a reason why we're called human beings and not human doings. Once in a while, along comes a day when there's nothing, absolutely positively nothing to do. And isn't that great? No school, no homework, no little league, no dance class, no play rehearsal, no soccer practice, no computer camp, no anything. Just a white empty space on the calendar. Of course, some people get a little worried about these spaces. These people are very nice and wear big shoes, but we'll think about them a little later. But what do you do when there's nothing to do? Well, I have heard stories, wonderful stories about taking off your shoes and walking through green grass or mud in your bare feet or making toy ships out of sticks and sailing them across a puddle that somehow seems as wide as an ocean. 
I've heard about lying on your back and watching clouds turn from dinosaurs into crocodiles, into dragons, into bears, into butterflies, into clouds. Or lying on your stomach, watching an ant carry something three times bigger than he is while you wonder, how can he do that? And what do ants eat for breakfast that makes them so strong? I've heard of making a paper airplane do loop-de-loops and barrel rolls in the soft summer air, then land smooth as butter on bread. Or building a fort, a secret place where no one can see you because you can't see them, and surviving for hours on peanut butter sandwiches and lemonade. I've heard about catching fireflies on a warm evening and putting them into a jar until you have two hands full of gold and then letting them all go. I've heard of swinging until your toes touch the clouds or hanging by your knees like a monkey just to find out how monkeys feel. I've heard of climbing a good tree that's been waiting all its long life just to be climbed by you or finding a quiet spot and reading your very favorite book and then reading it again just because it is your favorite. I've heard stories about exploring places that really need to be explored, about making angels in the snow or igloos or caves or sledding or tasting icicles or throwing snowballs or building round fat men with orange noses and old hats who smile at everyone. Why? I've heard of swimming and building sandcastles and hopscotching and jump roping and running and throwing and bouncing and painting and drawing and playing with toys and puzzles and dolls and games and puppies and kittens and hamsters and gerbils and doing cartwheels and doing somersaults and doing well sometimes just doing nothing. And maybe one of the best ways to do nothing is to show someone else how to do it. Maybe even someone with big shoes. Just to remind them sometimes that doing nothing is the most important thing in the whole wide world to do. And that is the end of our story today. Thank you. Each week we take up a collection to support the programs of this church and our partners in the world. There are a couple ways to donate. First, you can send a check to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln, 6300 A Street, and write Sunday Plate in the memo line. Second, if you're a member, you can give through our online database, Realm, or probably the easiest way to give is by texting UC Lincoln and the amount you wish to give to 73256. That's UC Lincoln and the amount you wish to give to 73256. Thank you for your generosity. December 26. That was the day in 2009 when our baby was due to be born. My husband William, or Big Daddy as he had taken to calling himself by that point, was eager to see our child face to face. He felt that when they gazed into each other's eyes, that would be the first moment when he met this new little person. I longed to hold her in my arms. When I could stroke her back and kiss her soft head, that's when the waiting would be over. Putting up the Christmas tree and decorations had helped to keep my mind and hands busy as the due date neared. In our preparations for the birth, we had learned it was a good idea to have things to do 
to stay occupied during the early stages of childbirth. But I had completed all of those activities long before the first sign of labor. At least I was home where I could nest, not riding on a donkey to a strange place like the Holy Family in the Christmas story. Our midwife, Mary Helen, modeled patience as our due date of December 26 rolled past on the calendar, and then the 27th, the 28th, the 29th, the 30th, the 31st. First babies typically arrive late, Mary Helen assured us. It was our first taste of all the patience that this new role of parent would require of us. I was working on a jigsaw puzzle of a bright red cardinal in the snow at 11 p.m. on New Year's Eve when contractions finally started. Our child was born in the wee hours of January 1st and at last, to my great joy, placed in my arms. She was well worth the wait. This pandemic era is a bit like a pregnancy on a global scale. We're in a time between times, a time that will forever be remembered as different from all that came before it and after it. Like an expectant couple, we are eager to get through the period of danger and to the other side when our patience, our endurance, if nothing else, will be rewarded with new life. The course of the pandemic, alas, is, is less predictable than a pregnancy. We may end up months rather than days overdue in getting to safety. But whenever that day does come, just like new parents, our lives will never be the same. Meanwhile, we wait. Now, if you're like me, you have a long list of things you are eager to do again when it's safe. Mine includes get a massage, that's at the very top of my list, a professional haircut, go on a traveling vacation, visit extended family and friends, go to the movies in a theater, do everyday errands without a mask, without fear nibbling away, send my child to school without mask or sanitizer, to do all the things children should do in school, including group work and field trips and extracurriculars. And this is a big one. Sing in the sanctuary next to other beloved people and experience the support of community firsthand. My list is that of a fairly fortunate person some people's waiting wish lists include more basic, basic things like retaining a steady job. While we wait it out, what are the equivalent of prenatal vitamins and cat-cow yoga stretches? In this time of enforced stillness, how can we tend to our collective health and the well-being of the future world waiting to be born? Of course, being vigilant about following public health measures is vital. We, we can actually help make this waiting period shorter if we avoid crowded places and mask up and isolate when we should. As for the future world waiting to be born, we can nurture caring connections among people, reorganize our own priorities and habits for simple living, and use this time to reshape our social institutions and culture to better serve all. Every step in that direction will make for a more beautiful future. This period of waiting can be an active one, forming the tissues and organs of a more meaningful life for individuals and a renewed social order. As part of our service each week, we take time to recognize the joys and sorrows that are part of our life as a community, because we know that what happens to one of us matters to all of us.
This is central to who we say we are as Unitarian Universalists. We believe that we are caught up in an interconnected web of existence, that we are all a part of it, and that each life has inherent worth and dignity. And so when we gather, we take some time to recognize what's happened in our lives, because that matters to us as a community. As this next song plays, take a moment to type in the chat box either your name or the name of somebody that you're holding either in joy or in sorrow this morning. Thank you for your presence. pregnancy. Waiting is part of the mundane fabric of everyday life, not just the big events. We wait in checkout lines and doctor's offices. We wait for illness to run its course, for vacations to roll around, for grief to soften. At this time of year, we wait for the sun's pattern to shift from shorter and darker days to longer, lighter ones again. Perhaps we wait to find out what is in that odd-sounding box under the Christmas tree. But just because waiting is commonplace doesn't mean it's easy. It can be hard to stay in the moment when you are wondering if you can overcome a health challenge or whether a promising new relationship will stand the test of time or if enough people will wake up and act on climate change. Often we feel like we can't wait to do important things. We can't wait to graduate, to land a job, to meet the perfect partner. We can't wait to get this baby out of a pregnant belly and into our arms. 
to celebrate a special occasion, to become a grandparent, to retire. We are impatient to get on with it all. Why is waiting so hard? For one thing, our culture does little to cultivate patience. Here in 21st century America, the pace is fast, the forms of stimulation endless, the goal perpetual consumption. It is an age of fast food, smartphones, and attention deficit, an age of road rage. We're conditioned to multiply our desires, to never be satisfied, and to never hold still for long. As a young person, I was often restless, uncertain what I was called to do in this world, but driven to contribute in some meaningful way and subject to the rise and fall of moods over which it seemed I had little control. I started carrying around a pocket Tao Te Ching when I was in college. Chapter 15 was soon dog-eared and this verse underlined. Do you have the patience to wait till your mud settles and the water is clear? Lao Tzu was telling me that to get the clarity and steadiness I longed for, I needed patience. To actually enjoy my life, I needed to learn how to wait, to befriend stillness. In my 20s, I was attracted to a meditation practice, in part because of its promise to help moderate my ups and downs, making me more patient and steady. I found that when the wind speed of my mind fell during meditation, the water of my feelings churned less, and I could see more of what was going on within me and in the world. This is not always a pleasant experience. In fact, the initial effect of such inner settling may be a greater awareness of how agitated our minds usually are. As I made friends with what Buddha called the monkey mind, I increasingly recognized how conditioned I was for stimulation rather than for stillness. The process of slowing down the mind, reducing the wind speed on my inner pond and letting the silt settle could be rather uncomfortable at times. But I did find that the practice gave me more patience for the unfolding of my life. I might feel agitated while I was meditating, but I felt steadier in daily life. I soon concluded that this benefit alone made the effort of meditation worth it for me. Instead of seeing waiting as something unpleasant we're forced to do, we might look upon waiting as the essence of spiritual practice. Whether our practice is to bring our attention back repeatedly to a focal point of meditation or let thoughts slip by without holding on to them. Whether it's to listen in silent prayer for the still small voice within or to tune into beauty all around us in a walk in nature. Whatever method one uses, we're training our minds how to be completely present in the moment not expecting anything in particular to happen. This is, in fact, where Lao Tzu goes with chapter 15. Do you have the patience to wait till your mud settles and the water is clear? And the passage continues. Can you remain unmoving till the right action arises by itself? The master doesn't seek fulfillment, not seeking, not expecting. She is present and can welcome all things. We can welcome all things. As we learn to wait in spiritual disciplines or in daily life, we may find we are able to experience more fully, more consciously, whatever is going on in our depths, anger, joy, 
grief, love, fear, longing. We're more able to bear all the pains and pleasures of living. We may become less guarded toward life and more aware of what really matters. Waiting does not always lead to more vivid self-knowledge or to more intentional choices. But even when we feel like we are in a dry spell, not feeling the connection to source, not seeing the beauty all around us, not hearing the inner teacher, often something is actually moving far below the surface. The monsters in the deep are shifting. The log jams are clearing. The root of the lotus plant is growing upward from the muddy floor toward the light. When we learn to wait, to sit in silence with whatever is happening in our life, to honor our longing for spaciousness within ourselves, when we can do that, the mud within us can settle so that we feel more clear, more pure, unencumbered by the past, open to the future. This not only benefits us, it benefits the people in our lives who may well be drawn to our inner calm. It may even contribute to a shift in our wider culture toward greater patience and a greater ability to bear pain and discomfort rather than covering up our pain or acting out in ways that can sometimes be tragic. I believe this kind of spiritual work Learning to ride the currents of life from a place of inner stillness can have a healing effect that begins with us and radiates outward. Now there is another kind of waiting for life, a kind of waiting where we are waiting for something to happen. The birth of a child is an archetypal waiting of this sort, with each kick or movement presaging a new future. For me, the last four years, from one election to the next, have felt even more uncomfortable than all the dimly remembered discomforts of pregnancy as I wondered from month to month and tweet to tweet, when will it finally be over? When can I stop reacting to one after another policy undermining human worth and get back to shaping a new world, working for positive changes that I want to see advanced? Paradoxically, I believe that embracing stillness 
can sometimes move us forward. I can learn to be present and welcome all things and be an agent of change as well. So then, how do I wait when the world is in turmoil? What does faithful waiting look like if I want the world on the other side of this waiting to be more just, more beautiful, more likely to sustain life than the pre-pandemic world? I'm convinced that the frantic busyness that got us into our present predicament, an inequitable, unsustainable world order that the pandemic merely exacerbates, that same way of being cannot get us out of it. Filling every empty pandemic hour with Netflix, for example, may pass the time, but it won't change a thing. Instead, during those more momentous periods of waiting in our lives, when we're waiting for inspiration, for clarity, for breakthrough, we might actually seek out stillness and silence. We may regard agitation amid stillness as normal, a sign that we are in fact downshifting and getting more in touch with ourselves and with life. What we can do is center our relationships, focus on starting or deepening a spiritual practice, and choose one positive project to be involved with that will matter. While they are waiting out the pandemic, over half a million Americans have volunteered to be subjects in cl clinical trials for COVID-19 vaccines, over half a million. I could only guess at the untold number of masks that have been sewn in homes and given away to help stop the spread. Beyond COVID, many people across the country, including Unitarian Universalists right here in Nebraska, participated in vigorous get out the vote efforts over the summer and fall. They didn't let the pandemic get in the way of boosting civic participation and strengthening this nation at a critical moment for our democracy. They built on the patient work of people like Stacey Abrams in Georgia, who worked diligently over several years to register new voters and mobilize previously disenfranchised voters, resulting in a new direction for her state, at least in the presidential race. We too can take practical steps to create the world that we dream of. But like having a baby, we can't rush the process of transformation. Especially if we are working for fundamental change, we can't cut short the gestation period. If we have passed from caterpillar to chrysalis, we cannot burst out before our new wings are formed. Sometimes when our dreams are big, waiting is part of the work. Spring cannot come before the leaves of autumn fall and form new loam, before the seeds hibernate in the cold winter earth. Waiting is part of the work. Let us take this time of waiting as a time to build our inner resources, to discern how each of us individually is called to contribute and to take concrete steps in the direction of our dreams. Meanwhile, I invite you also to keep good company while you wait, with loved ones, with fellow seekers like those assembled here, and with spiritual companions from ages past, like Lao Tzu, people who have left testimony of their own graceful waiting. May we have the patience to wait till our mud settles and the water is clear. May we each listen for what love is calling us to do so that even when the world seems frozen, we keep faith with our highest values. During this season of waiting, let us continue working to create peace in ourselves and in our world. So may it be, amen.
We have the patience to wait till our mud settles and the water is clear. And in this season of waiting, may we wait in ways that are faithful to our visions of peace on earth and goodwill to all. So may it be. Amen. <laughs>